Good afternoon, everybody. It is Tuesday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner. I am a digital sports producer at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and I'm joined today by Jason Mackey to do some Pirates over-unders. Spring training is close, Jason. Um, so I'm excited to get into talking about you know some actual numbers and talking some actual baseball. How about you, and how are you? Man, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Adam. I'm looking outside at snow, and there's nothing I'd rather be talking about than baseball. I don't care if they're over-unders or predictions or anything like that. I, uh, I I know you and I go back and forth on the the prediction stuff, and I feel like a grumpy old man yelling at clouds with this stuff. I see value in it. I get it, um, but I also have a little bit of a philosophical issue with it, but we'll get into that. I'm doing well. Well, absolutely. It's, yeah, like you said, it's a snowy morning. I just got back from Colorado. Um, we're still a long way. What'd you say? Said, you jerk. I know, right? Yeah. So there's, this is a lot less snow than I saw up there. <laughs> um, so, but we're, we're going to, I'm excited to get into it. Um, I, I feel like it's the perfect fodder for, for this time of year. So, um, Jason, I'll just start off by saying that the reason we're having this conversation is um, I did a post this morning on postgazette.com. You can check the link out down in the description um, called uh, the Pirates 2023 Zips Projections. If you're not familiar, uh, Dave Samborski from Fangraphs every year puts out his um, just statistical modeling projections of what's going to happen for the local baseball team and every baseball team. Um, he kind of goes player by player and, and says, like, you know, this is the, the hitting line that I think we're going to see from Andrew McCutcheon or – um, you know, this is the ERA we expect to see from Mitch Keller based on three to four years of past data in the minor leagues, in the major leagues, um, kind of cobbling that all together and, and spitting out a number of, of what we can expect. Um, and so that's kind of the inspiration here. It's it's uh, the fodder. Um, his big opinion at the start of, of the uh, piece, and I'll link to it again down in the description, is that uh, the Pirates free agent spending isn't going to amount to much. Um, he's much more excited about some of the the Pirates' young players and think they're going to have a much bigger impact on any improvement we may see from this team that lost 100 games last year. What is your general assessment of of that uh, you know logic that that this team's more so going to go as far as the young players are going to carry it? Well, I agree with that um, when when phrased that way. I mean, ultimately, like the Pirates are going to get better, good, sustainably better and good when their young players come through. Um, now, I disagree with Simborski in saying that the veteran players that they've added will be worth very little. I, I think that some of the veteran guys they brought in are actually going to be quite helpful, specifically at first base. Um, I don't think, you know, G-Man Choi and Carlos Santana are going to morph into the second coming of Freddie Freeman or something like that. But I, I, they stunk at first base last year. Like at minimum, they're going to be competent and be able to drive in some runs from that position. Um, behind the plate, like I know people like to bag on Austin Hedges offense and that's fine. I'm not of the, I'm not in the camp that I really care what a catcher does offensively. And if you're looking at him to save your offense, you're already screwed. Like if he can handle a pitching staff and frankly, just go out there more times than not. And we're not having to look at, you know, a rotating door of Jose Godoy and Josh Van Meter and God knows who else caught for this team last season. Like that's an improvement and that's an improvement in a way that you can't really quantify with numbers. Um, you know, like I respect what Simborski does. He's really good at it. These projections make sense. I mean, the pirates do their own projections, Adam. I mean, it's like everybody does them. I understand the value in them. It's just, it's not, it's not gospel. And I'm not saying you're taking it as gospel. I do think some people do though and say like, Oh, well, this is what's going to happen because no, there's, there's, cracks in there that need filled in and so i look at a hedges thing and how hedges handles the starting pitching staff how he calls a game that stuff is tough to quantify and so i do think to, to boomerang back to my original point i do think some of the free agent signings are going to matter more so than are reflected in the projections yeah i think for me the thing about projections is you're always going to have guys that go over and you're always going to have guys that go under and and it's a question of which guys those are going to be and where things are going to kind of even out you know i agree with you it's not gospel um i think it's a good starting point um and then you know you just kind of figure you, you i look at the numbers and that's what we're going to do now is you know looking at the numbers and saying where are they high where are they low uh where do we think things are going to even out i'm going to start with you with the the one that jumped off the page the most to me um uh, which is that you know over a full season which we're not going to see from andy rodriguez yeah. uh because he's not going to be on the opening day roster but um, Zips is projecting that if he was, he would be worth 
2.6 wins above replacement, flirting with 20 homers. Um, what do you think of that one? That one jumped off the page. That seemed high to me. Um, you know, the, the Pirates have rarely gotten guys coming up from Indy, you know, produced at that rate, even if it's on a relative scale, you know, just from June. You know, so let's let's cut it down to two thirds, um, you know, somewhere in the upper ones in terms of wins above replacement. If that's when we see Indy Rodriguez, what do you think about that rate of production from him? Um, the catching prospect who, you know, people are excited about, but I don't know if I was supposed to be that excited about him. Yeah, right. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that I don't know. Nobody knows. Scouts who do this stuff for a living, they don't know. And you want to build in, you know, whatever former intelligence you have. There's no form of intelligence to tell us how Andy Rodriguez is going to perform at the major league level. He's never been at the major league level. What has he spent? Six or 12 games, one or the other at AAA. And I mean, I'm not trying to bag on Andy Rodriguez by by all means. Like he's probably their most exciting prospect, a really good hitter. And I, I can't wait to watch him play more. But we don't know how he's going to perform at the major league level and saying he's going to hit 20 homers as a rookie. Like, you know, I guess I, I can see where you're going to make that leap and you're going to say like a really good prospect who's been trending the right way, who hits triple A pitching is going to fare well. But like we don't know. We don't know how that's going to compartmentalize in Andy's head. I mean, he could get up here and be a nervous wreck and be chasing everything and be completely wrapped around the axle. I don't think that's going to happen, but it could happen. It could. Um, so anyway, where I come down with it is, I mean, I think that's a possible outcome. I think that would be a really good possible outcome for the Pirates. But I don't, you know, I just don't look at that as anything more than that's what one person thinks or that's maybe a, you know, <laughs> this is this is an optimistic hope. I know Simborski is not, you know, generally not terribly favorable toward the Pirates. And that's fine. I understand that's not a criticism. It's just, you know... <laughs> That's what people probably want to read and want to believe. Yeah, Jason, I think that's the piece of the pie that's that's missing um, is is the high minors and 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 you know I, I think it's hard to project a, a, a any kind of prospect, but I think it's especially hard to project a prospect, you know, without that high minors component of of what he did at that level. Um, so I think that's the thing that's missing on Nindy Rodriguez. I kind of look at you know I I kind of look at two point six wins as a high bar for him to reach or at least producing at that rate. Um, yeah. So I would say, you know, over a full season, he would go under on that one. Um, next thing I wanted to ask you about – oh, go ahead. Real quick, six play, six games, 23 plate appearances is what Andy has done at AAA. Like, I don't know, man. That's a large leap trying to predict what somebody did from AA to the, the majors. And that's what you're saying, that last piece of the pie. So, anyway. Yeah, continue. I will say that I know – yeah, I'll say that I, it is also true that the Pirates, you know – it's it's questionable how much they view you know Indianapolis as for development compared to Altoona and and um, you know maybe that's that's something that that my expectations are missing as a as a growing to be older school kind of baseball fan but um, you know still I, I think you'd like to see a little bit more at AAA um, speaking of AAA there's a lot of uh, young pitchers who Zips is actually pretty excited for um, with regard to the Pirates Mike Burrows I think is the biggest name. Uh, but also Johan Oviedo, Luis Ortiz, Quinn Priester. Um, it projects all of them in the, in the majors at around 4.3 ERAs. That doesn't sound phenomenal, but given some of the stuff the Pirates have run out there um, for starts the last handful of years, um, you know, you're starting to see some real pitching depth. Um, and, and I think that's my – this. I guess this isn't so much an over-under question, Jason, as much as it's do you think that this – that that's a reflection of the depth that the, the pirates have begun to build in the starting pitching area. And, and that maybe these days of, you know, if, if you have to dip outside that rotation into guys, six, seven, eight in the organization that you're going to see the pirates just have a, a greater depth of, of players to draw from in the year ahead. Yeah, I hope so. And I think so. Um, I really like Quinn Priester and Mike Burroughs. I've said this on, on the same podcast with you a lot, like those kids are going to be good, man they've got stuff, they've got makeup, they've, they have brains, they know what they're doing. Um, I don't know if they're going to be good immediately. Like everybody requires some adjustment time. Burroughs required adjustment to triple a Priester has required some development or uh, adjustment to double a, but you know, like I'm going to bet on those kids figuring it out based on talent and head on their shoulders and work ethic and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the, the bigger question with the Pirates is, is their pitching staff deeper? Yes, I think it is. And I think that 
what you're doing with Hill and Velasquez, and I know some people don't like it, but what you're doing is pushing people down into other roles that they should be occupying. You know, if you believe that like Mitch and Rowanzi can be atop your rotation, which for the Pirates, they probably can, you know, and they're probably threes and fours on other teams. But for the Pirates, they're ones and twos. Um, you know, can Hill and Velasquez fill in there somewhere? Probably. And on the fringe, you're looking at like Brubaker, Oviedo, bringing up young guys, not asking a ton out of them. Um, if you're going to dip into some of that depth, yes, it looks a lot different when you're, I don't know, when you're going to the sixth and seventh inning, fifth, sixth, seventh inning, something like that, and you're going to lean on a Chase DeYoung, who, again, was objectively good last year, like is, is not a bum pitcher and has done some things, and you lean on him in the early innings versus you have somebody who probably has no business being in the major leagues. And I'm not going to name names, but we've seen plenty of them over the past handful of years. So, yes, they're building that depth out. Are they done? No, absolutely not. Do they need to bring more young kids along? Yes, they do. There are more young kids coming. I hope to see Kyle Nicholas, Carmen Majinski. There's going to be other young guys coming up. Jared Jones is one who maybe not this year, but next year. Um, so they're they're getting young arms. If they trade Reynolds, I would hope that they prioritize another arm there. I believe they will. And this, I say a lot, needs to be a cycle. You need to keep bringing up arms, keep getting arms, can never have enough. Let me ask the over-under question this way, Jason. Of that group of four, Priester, uh, Ortiz, Oviedo, and Burroughs, do any of them get 10 starts given that there are you know, a lot of guys in this rotation already that, that kind of seem to be ahead of them in line? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I would say Oviedo gets 10 um, and maybe Ortiz. I don't see Burroughs or Priester getting 10 starts. Um, you know, Priester started twice in triple A. If he made 12 more there, I wouldn't have an issue with it. I'm not, I'm not ready to rush him. Like I'm, whenever, whenever the time is right. Um, Burroughs was kind of a mixed bag last year. I want to say he made like 11, 12, something like that. First four were kind of crappy and the last seven or eight were good. Um, you know, if he shows me something, I'd maybe jump him up here early, but like you signed Velasquez, you signed Hill, let him pitch. You know, I'm not going to take the ball from Mitch. I'm not going to take the ball from Rowe. I'm not going to take the ball from Brubaker. Like, those guys should pitch on turn. If they went to a six-man rotation and, and brought in Oviedo early, I'd be fine with it. Um, I think with Ortiz, the challenge he's going to face is going to be a lot like what we saw with Contreras this season. The Pirates, as an organization, are uber cautious with guys with, you know, young arms, not a lot of miles on the tires. They throw hard. They've got hard breaking stuff like the Pirates are probably going to pump the brakes on Ortiz and say, we need to build in a development window and shut them down and all this stuff. And people are going to freak out. But like we've seen enough of this. So I, I don't know if I see him getting 10 starts of something in my eye. Sorry. Um, but no, I, Oviedo is grown up, deserves a starting spot. I talked to Oscar Marine two weeks ago um, and he told me that he remains a starter. So if he's a starter, he has nothing left to gain in the minors, in my opinion. I, I see him getting double-digit starts and, you know, maybe, maybe Ortiz. Okay, we're going to get into some of the bigger names now, Jason. Um, the big one for me was uh, Brian Hayes. He's going into year four. Um, mm -hmm. Zips does not love his bat still. Um, it, it's projecting him for a sub-700 OPS. Obviously, his glove is, is still great. Obviously, that's what makes him productive. I think that's what justifies his contract. But I think a lot of Pirates fans would like to see um, just a little bit more from the bat. I don't think anyone's expecting him to be a 30 home run hitter or, you know, that kind of player. But I think people would like to see something over a 700 OPS. So I'm going to ask the over-under this way. Over-under 700 OPS. Over. I'm going to take the over. And this is where this is where the zip stuff breaks down with me. And I'm glad you brought up Hayes. Um, I understand the criticisms based on what he's done offensively the past couple of years. Like, it hasn't been good. I'm not defending it. Um, I'm not even defending how frequently he's gotten hurt. It's been too much. Um, they need to find a way. He needs to find a way to just be less injured. Um, some of it's not his fault either, of course. Um, but, like, that that's the factor at play here. Like, he is healthy now. They believe he's healthy. He needs to stay healthy. I think his production looks a lot different if he is healthy. And there's no mechanism built into any sort of projection that's going to tell me if Key Brian Hayes is going to be healthy or if he's not going to be healthy. So if he stays healthy for the entirety of 2023, I do believe there's more in there and he will be well over a 700 OPS. Now, if he injures his wrist in the second game of the season 
and then has a back issue and then has a knee issue and then has God knows what issue, like that's probably going to be negatively affected. And I think the Pirates and their fans and everybody else is going to grow tired of him being banged up too much. Um, that's just the reality of it. Like, I think he's a very good player, but I think he needs either, you know, I don't want to make the Bo Bennett comparison to hockey, but like you need to wrap him in bubble wrap or something and just keep him on the field. I want to see what that looks like. Yeah, I think I think that that's you know I think seven hundred is a reasonable baseline. Let me ask uh, maybe a quick follow up. Uh, do you think he can flirt with eight hundred, or do you think maybe seven fifty somewhere in in between seven eight is where he settles in? I think that's probably more more realistic, Adam. I mean, I think long term, I'd like to see him as an eight hundred OPS guy. I think it's there, but I I would come off as not saying he's going to go from what was he at like six seventy something six six fifty nine maybe like to, to say he's going to clear eight hundred. Like no, I mean I. You know, I, I, I would be thrilled if he settled at 770, seven, got up to 780. That would be that would be a perfect uh, next step for him. I mean, I think that could make him a five win player, Jason. And, and at that level, you're, yeah, all, you know, you're, an all-star, you're an all star level guy, even though if the, if the offensive <laughs> numbers don't jump off the page, the defense does. And, and I think that, you know, a five win player is pretty, pretty friggin good, <laughs> you know, in yeah. terms of. No. Uh, you know what? I mean, Adam, he should be able to get on base. He should be able to hit with power. He's athletic. He's stolen bases. Like, there's no excuse for him not having a 750 OPS. I mean, we're not talking about 900. I'm not talking about MVP candidates. I'm just like, you know, hold your spot in the order. Uh, and, you know, th- this isn't a commentary on the Pirates spending money, but like, they're spending a little bit more on him. You want him to be a, a meat of the order hitter hitting the two hole, hitting the five hole, hit somewhere where you're going to produce runs. Like, I think I've said something like this on Twitter before. Like if he's hitting eighth, that's bad. I, I really don't like, – that's not reflective of his skill set, I don't think, and it's it's not good um, – what, what is it, cost-benefit or, you know, the the Pirates aren't, aren't getting what they're paying for at that point. I don't care how good the defense is. They need more offense. Well, I'll actually be the sunny optimist and say that I think they are getting what they're paying for from his glove alone, um, you know, just just given what it does on the war scale. But, you know, I think to make the contract valuable and, and you know, pay off in a, in a big way, um, you know, and get the kind of that excess value, you need him to start to hit. Um, another one of his big name teammates, Jason, that I wanted to hit on was O'Neill Cruz. Um, Zips is kind of like you know, they think he's going to be a pretty good player. I think that, that it was 2.7 wins, um, you know, was the, the top line number. But when you go down under the hood, um, they're projecting 22 homers, which seemed low to me. So I, I guess I'll do the first half of over under 22 for you. I'm going to go over on that, but I just wanted to see what you thought. Yeah, I'm going over too. I, I think if you, if you tell me O'Neill Cruz is going to play 150 games, I'm looking at a 30 homer season. Like I don't, I mean, that dude like accidentally hits home runs. I'm not saying like the batting average is going to be sparkling. He might make 92 errors, but yeah, I would, I would take an over on the 22 homers for sure. Yeah. I, the 30 was kind of the number that I had in mind as well. Yeah. You know, the, just, I think he could, yeah, I think he could struggle and hit 25. You right. know, I, I think that, that is, you know, I think it's a bigger question whether he hits the 2.7 than whether he hits like 25 homers, just because I, I think his power just it, it, it leaps off the bat. Um, and, and I think that we saw the holes in his the other parts of his game show at different points last season. The question is, can he put those things behind him? So I'm more suspect of the 2.7 wins than I am of the, the, the you know, 22 homers or going over that number. I don't know where you land on that. Yeah, I mean, I go back and forth. And this is another thing that's really hard to predict because I think the wins is probably predicated, are predicated on like what he does defensively and what he does consistently, you know, it, can he hit left-handers? Can he hit off-speed stuff? How much do they stay, stay out of the zone, and, and does he chase? Um, it's been stuff that he worked on, and he looked really good over the final month or so of the season, but is that going to stick for all of 2023? I'd like to think it would. I mean, he's worked really hard on his defense. Does that automatically mean it's going to improve? Not necessarily. Um, I'm going to go over the 2.7 because I think there's a ton there with O'Neal, and I really like the makeup but I don't feel like I I do think there's a possibility that it lands below that based on some of the volatility that we've seen from him too. Yeah. I'm going to go push on the 2.7. I think that'd be, you know, a really good number for him to do, um, you know, at this stage of his development. Do I think he can be a better player than that long-term? 
Uh, yes, you know, I think he can be a, a four or five win player. I think he has that potential. Uh, but I think 2.7 this year would be, you know, his first full big league season. If he can hit 2.7 and get to, uh, you know, 30 home runs, um, you know, I, I think if you're a Pirates fan, you've got to be thrilled with that. So I'm going to go push on that one. Um, Jason, the next person I want to get into is Mitch Keller. Um, I think that this is – he is probably the best example for me of where um, the stats may miss something uh, because obviously the pitcher he was at the begin, you know, the first half of last season versus the second half when he – um, really started throwing that sinker well and, and making it work. Um, you know, he was pitching to like, you know, a mid threes ERA, um, sometimes lower over, over certain spans. Um, Zips has him pitching to a 4.37. Um, and that's where I think that makes sense to me if you're looking at the overall numbers, but I think it's not taking into account the trajectory that we saw with Mitch Keller. Um, so I'm going to pose the question this way, over under four ERA. And then I have some follow-ups. Yep. I'm going under a four ERA for Mitch. Well, let's go follow ups. I and I agree with everything you just said. Like it requires nuance. It requires watching what he's done and realizing how much the sinker meant to him. But yes, short answer. I'm going under four. Okay. Well, here's if he doesn't go under four, is that a disappointment? Yes, I think so. I would. I would. I mean, if it's four point oh one, I I would be okay with that. But you know, like let's say Mitch really struggles and you know winds up with a 470 ERA or something like I would say that's a disappointment sure you know I think he showed flashes last year of being the type of pitcher he was projected to be and was largely the project pitcher he was projected to be outside of the gaudy strikeout totals and you know we know why like he's throwing a sinker more for contact and working on pitch efficiency that's great um, but yeah if that if that backslides you know nearly that would be I'm trying to think of his stats I mean that's basically a whole run and then more when you when you factor in like May 30 and the rest of the season, whenever he was throwing that sinker, like the last 22 starts, I think was like 322 ERA was really good. Um, so, yeah, if he if he goes 470 over the whole season, that's that's too high. And frankly, Adam, I don't think that's going to happen. I just don't. I don't I don't see Mitch suddenly losing handle on what was a really good season for him. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm curious to see how the league adjusts. Um, there's obviously been a lot of film study. And, and you know, I wrote at one point last season that that the other pitches, just the, the pitch values on them on fan graphs are not great. Um, yeah. You know, if people start to figure out that sinker. If, if he doesn't have a way to counterpunch, um, you know, I can see things. I, I don't see him, like, you know, completely losing himself and having, like, a 6 ERA like we've seen from him at times um, in his big league career. But I, I think in terms of taking that next step, um, I'm not as sold that, that that's necessarily a given. I think there's reason to be hopeful, but I think, you know, those first 10 starts are going to tell us a lot about the pitcher he's going to be over, over the season. Um, yep. I guess I'm going to go another, um, push on the four. I think he'll go under the four, three, seven that Zips is projecting. Um, but I'm going to go a push on the, on the four, um, and, and leaving room for him to, um, you know, prove that, that he really can be the consistent pitcher. A lot of Pirates fans want him to be. Um, Jason, the, we talked a little bit about the free agents at the top of the show. Um, I want to get back into it now. Basically, uh, Zips only sees Carlos Santana of that group going over one win. They have him at 1.4, um, which would be a little bit of underachievement based on what they're um, you know paying for him. Um, but then you have Rich Hill, Austin Hedges, Andrew McCutcheon, um, Vince Velasquez among the big names. Um, all at a win or lower. Rich Hill's projection, I think, is actually pretty rough. They have him at a 497 ERA. He was much better than that last season. Um, of that group of, of four guys, let's exclude Santana for a minute. Yep. Um, how many of them do you think are going to go over one win? So what do I have? Five? I have Hedges, McCutcheon. Let me just count them. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Um, three? Is that overly optimistic? Like, I don't agree with the Hill projection. Um, I don't agree with the 497 ERA. I think it'll be lower. Um, I'm not sure how we go from how he performed. Like, if we're using previous Intel built into this, how did we determine that the, like, age 42 to 43 curve is when it happens? Like, the, is, there, is there historical data to show that left-handed pitchers who are curveball-based, that's when they really, like, hit the hit the cliff, 42 into 43, so his ERA is going to drop more than a full run? I 
I, I, I'm not understanding that. Um, well, if I had to guess, Jason, I'll just hop in and say yeah. I, I, I am betting that the, the statistical curve took him down well before this um, and, and that, you know, you're it seeing the reflection. Yeah. And, 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 but that is, that is probably where it comes from. It's, that's not just the difference between 42, 43. It's probably the difference between 37 and 38, you know, and, and he's just now so far on the other end of that that he's getting but, hurt. But again, that's the philosophical thing. Like we've determined that now is when he's going to start pitching like crap. Right? Like, why Why didn't he pitch like crap last year? He was already past the statistical curve. Right. You know, he was already old. But we've determined magically that this is going to be the time. And it might be. I mean, you're running out of time. Like, it's going to be between 42 and 43. It's not going to be between 47 and 48. So, obviously, your bet looks better. Um, I just – I don't know. I don't know how we magically know that it's going to be this year. Why can't it be next year? Um, and maybe it is. Maybe it is this year. Or maybe it's when he gets traded to another team – in June, you know, he falls apart for the race. I don't know. Um, I, I struggle with this though. Like over one win. I, I don't want to sound like I'm bagging on McCutcheon. Cause I, like I, I'm saying, he's not a one win player. I don't know if he's going to have an opportunity to exceed one win. So I don't know if I see that. Um, I see Santana becoming a productive player. And I think that's going to diminish opportunities for Choi. And that like, Kutch as well. I, I don't I don't know if I see Choi becoming more of a regular than Santana. And so I see Santana exceeding that. I don't see Choi exceeding that. I'm trying to think through. Like I do think Hill and I, I sort of I'm not sure how to feel about Rich Hill because I know it's only going to be a partial season. Right. Um, I do think Hedges could be worth more than one win. And I know that's probably the most extreme take there is. Like people think he's going to be terribly off terrible offensively. I think there's going to be more value there. So I don't know. When you're asking me to pick, like, how many do I think are going to exceed one? I would get, my number would be three now that I'm thinking through this. But it's just like it's hard to say on the spot exactly who that would be. But that's that's what's in my head as far as like how these values get achieved and, you know, whatever. I think the usage the usage question is the is the big part of that. I think if, if Andrew McCutcheon plays 150 games, you know, could I see him? I I would be surprised if he didn't get over one over 150 games, but I don't, I don't, I don't think we're going to play, play 150 that. games. Right. So that's the thing. Like, yeah. So, so I, I think that makes it complicated for me. And, and I think you, you know, you make a great point as well. We don't know how many innings Vince Velasquez is going to get. We don't know how many innings Rich Hill is going to get. Um, if they both get to a hundred, I think they have both have a chance to go over that. Um, yeah. You know, if they get less than that, I, I think it's going to be tough. So, um, and, and Adam, it, like, are these projections just for like their time with the Pirates, or are we saying all of their 2023 season? Because like with Choi, well, they're projecting that they're going to be on the the team. Yes, it, it, they're playing for the they're go, they're going to do that for the team that they're on okay. over a year. Now they might get traded, but that's the the baseline. Yeah, the team that they're on, okay. Because yeah. like Choi, they're gonna they're gonna run him hard early on and try to trade him. They're mm -hmm. gonna play him and then try to trade him. But like, I don't know what his next opportunity is gonna look like. I don't know if that's going to, you know, run his elbow into the ground like that. That's just what I struggle with. And then I don't know. I yeah, don't know. no, no. I, and I just think it's an interesting question because, you know, the Pirates have spent a lot of money this this season. And the question, you know, I have is how much are you going to get for that? And I, I think one yeah. win makes it kind of a good baseline. So um, I'm going to go one for now out of those four, um, not counting Choi, because I, I guess I put him in the trade bucket. Um, I'm going to say it's going to be Rich Hill. Would you say? You're creating outs now. You're he was the trade bucket, not the free agent. This is ridiculous. Well, well, you know, I think three is a good number for counting Choi. Um, you know, I think it's reasonable. I, I, I'm just going to go with. I think it's going to be Rich Hill. I think he's going to get the opportunity to do it um, with a strong start because he, the goal is to, to trade him as well, right? So I'm, I'm going to say Rich Hill uh, goes over, um, but not that these other guys are completely useless. You know, I, I think it's it's just a matter of opportunity, like you said. So we'll find out. Um, Jason, I, uh, before I get to the big question I have at the end here, um, one thing that did kind of stand out to me in the data is that there's a big group of young guys. Let me pull up my list here. Um, Travis Swaggerty, Juwan Bay, Cal Mitchell, Cannon Smith and Jigba, Rodolfo Castro, Jack Sawinski, um, and then obviously former number one overall pick, Henry Davis. Of that group, Zips does not have a single one of them going over 1.3 wins. Um, I, I think Castro's the, the big one that stood out to me. I think they think he's going to be pretty bad. I mean, th they have a sub 230 batting average, um, a sub 300 um, on base percentage. Um, what do you think of, of that group as a whole? 
A, do you think multiple of them have a chance to get over two wins? I'm going to set that as the over-under. Um, and, you know, if if you do think it's multiple, who are those guys? Okay. I don't know if I see multiple over two wins, Adam. I, I think I see the only t- possible two-win player there is Sawinski. Um, and even that, I question how close he's going to get because of the opportunity available. I, I think I see the outfield playing out as like Reynolds is going to be there every day, at least until the trade deadline. That's my belief. Um, I think they're going to want to play McCutcheon a decent amount. I think at this point they're going to want to play Connor Joe a decent amount, um, whether people agree or disagree with that. And so what opportunity that leaves, like maybe Jack nudges his way there. I think there's, you know, he's probably the furthest along and can help them the most. Um, so yeah, possible two win guys, I'd put Sawinski. I understand where Zips is coming from with the Castro stuff. And I I don't necessarily believe he's going to be anything great either. I think it's a distinct possibility that G1 Bay could be a more productive second baseman or even Tucapita Marcano. I think it's far from assumed that that Castro is going to be your everyday se- second baseman. You know, there's there's something. This was a conversation with Derek Shelton the other day in his office about um, – he and O'Neill Cruz, Castro and O'Neill Cruz and how well they get along. And that's great. But I just, I don't know if Castro can, can like be consistent enough. We've seen strikeouts. We've seen sort of stupid stuff, not just with a cell phone, but not running balls out and just being kind of out to lunch. Generally like O'Neill Cruz has the talent to make up for some of that stuff. I'm not sure Rodolfo Castro does. And I don't think there's going to be a ton of patience for that because of, I don't know, Bay in contrast, like dude can fly, man. He gets on base. He can play multiple positions. They really like him. He might have more value to them. I don't know if that translates to over two wins. I don't think it does for right now. I think that's a crazy thing to say. Like a guy went from having 10, 10 MLB, MLB games to exceeding two wins. So anyway, I guess that's a long way of saying I see maybe one from that group and it would be Sawinski. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think that's maybe a little frustrating for Pirates fans to hear because, um, you know, at, at the stage of the rebuild, I think you'd like to see more of those guys sure. um, having found consistent roles to the point that you can, you know, get to that level of production if you're playing well. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's a definite source of, of frustration, but, you know, I understand it. Um, Jason, I'm going to wrap up on this. It's not Zips. It is Las Vegas. Um, we've talked a lot about how many games we think the Pirates are going to win um, this season. Vegas has set the number at 67 and a half. That would be uh, a five win improvement if you get to 67, but you'd still go under yeah. um, a six win improvement. If you go over, um, I, I know what your answer is going to be. So I'm going to set you up and let you go. <laughs> All right. I'm over. I'm over. Um, I've been saying consistently like between 72 and 76, I think 76 would be really, a, a impressive season for them based on what they're doing. Uh, I'll say 73 or 74 if I'm going to predict the win total. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if it really matters going 72, 75, 76, whatever, but I, I would feel comfortable taking the over if it's 67 and change. What about you? I'm going to go over the 67 and a half, but I'm not going to get to where you are in terms of the, the 73, 74. I think if they go under, it's going to be slight. Um, I think it's going to be 68, 69, 70, 71, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, You know, and I think it goes back to the free agents and um, you know, how much they spent and and how there's so much uncertainty with a lot of these guys we just finished up talking about. Um, You know, you're really putting a lot on, you know, your star players to get that level of improvement. Cause you're talking about going from what 62 to maybe 73, 74. I don't know if I see 12 wins above replacement, um, you know, coming from those free agents who we think may not get the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, those younger players that we expect to, to filter in that, that zips isn't very high on. So that's why I think you're going to go somewhere in the middle of that. Um, you're going to go over that Vegas win total. I think, you know, you and I probably know more about this team, um, then Vegas is probably paying attention to them at this point, but I also don't think that their number is that far off. Yeah, it's fair. I won't argue with that. I, I certainly understand what you're saying. Uh, you know, I, Vegas looks like it does for a reason. Um, so it, it's tough to argue. I will say from uh, being around the pirates and knowing their intent of at least a little bit, um, 
I don't think it would go over very well if they hit the under. Like if this Pirates team wins 66 games, I think there's going to be a lot of unhappy people at PNC Park, especially if they only win 62, 63, 64. Like there is, they believe they're putting together a better team than that. Um, we'll, we'll see if they're right or not. I just think that it, it would not go over well if they hit the under. Well, I think part of my question, Jason, is what's going to happen in the second half? Is Reynolds going to be traded? Is Rich Hill going to be traded? Is, um, you know, are, are you are going to see these guys that we talk about as interesting now be off the team for the last two months? And and is this a matter of where they, they maybe play like a 73-74 win team through that first half? But because they're out of it, they trade guys and they kind of go on those nosedives we saw in like 2011, uh, 2012, and, and, and they just can't quite get there. Um, I think that's where a lot of the losses are going to come. And I, I think that's part of the reason, too, that I would say making that 12, 13 win improvement, which would be huge, you know, on a, on a historic level. Um, I think that also makes that a little less likely. Yeah, no, I don't I don't disagree with you. I think it's going to be a challenge, <clears throat> excuse me, after the trade deadline, because I do think Reynolds will be out. I know Rich Hill will be out and probably a couple, you know. Velasquez is probably a push in that department. I, I don't think you see Choi and Santana remain with the team the entire year. I think one goes. I, I, I would put my money on Choi based on his contract status and, you know, frankly, like language barriers and mentoring young Dominican players. Like, I just think it's a better fit with Santana. Um, yeah, and it's it's then incumbent on how quickly some of these young guys grow up, right? Like, does Henry come up and contribute? Does Andy come up and contribute? Malcolm Nunez, Mike Burroughs, Quinn Priester. Um, even Jared Triolo, Colin Selby, Leo Pagero. Like we we don't know. I mean, you'd like to think that they come up and do something, but we don't know. Yeah, so I think that's I think that's an interesting point to end the discussion on, Jason. Um, I'm sure we're gonna talk a little. I, mean, I don't know, but it's possible the next time I'll talk to you, you'll be down in Florida, right? Yeah. I mean, I leave the day after the Super Bowl. So if let, let's let's hope. Not that I don't like seeing you, Adam, but I wouldn't mind a a semi-quiet roll into spring training here. Yeah, that'd be nice. Get a, get a little bit of a break before you head down. Well, Jason, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Again, I'm going to leave the link to the Zips uh, projections article down in the description. Um, just a couple of reminders before we let you go. If this is your first time, if, you enjoy, if you've made it to the 38-minute minute mark, uh, listening to me and Jason talk about stats, uh, please pop a like on this video. Help us out with the YouTube algorithm. Please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any videos. We're going to have a lot more Steelers talk this week with Christopher Carter on the North Shore Drive. Um, Noah Hiles, Abby Schnabel will be doing the college show um, on Thursday. So you're going to want to check all of that out. So make sure you're subscribed. And also, of course, further down in the description, I'm going to leave the link to our subscription deal, $6 for six months of access. That's going to get you up to opening day. It's going to get you past opening day um, with Jason's coverage. So make sure you're signed up for that as well. Um, otherwise we'll talk to you guys on Wednesday. Like I said, uh, it'll be Christopher Carter on the North shore drive. Don't know what he'll be talking about specifically. Don't know who his guest is going to be, but I can promise you if you're looking for Steelers talk, you're not going to find any place better in town. So check that out. Jason, thanks for joining me. Um, and we'll, I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you liked the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it on Apple Podcasts, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down in the description. Hey.